Good morning. Hope you're all doing very well this Sunday morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you from across the world, from Paraguay, um, where we are enjoying fall weather. Today was a bit cooler um, in the mid-20s, so it's nice to have a, a cooler weather. Um, much of what we are experiencing is the same thing that North America is, that the whole world is, um, with quarantine and with the world being locked down. Um, we're in a very strict quarantine here, actually. We can only leave the house to go to the grocery store, uh, the pharmacy. A few key people are allowed to go to work, but most people aren't allowed to do that. And the police are keeping a tight control on everything. So we've been sticking around home for the most part. Um, we're starting to uh, handle groceries this weekend to, to some people who are starting to go hungry because they haven't been able to work for, for up to three weeks now. And there's a few more weeks of this um, coming up. So there is, there is quite a bit of need here, and as a church we are um, going to help and support the people that, that need it. Um, we can't do that much, but we can help, help 30 families this weekend with that. So we're looking forward to that, a way to bless people in the middle of a hard time. And it raises the question, do we really know what God is doing? And sometimes we think we do. We pray for wisdom, we make plans, everything looks like it's going really good. You get the job you've been hoping for, your family is happy and healthy. You're able to make the trip you've been planning. You feel loved and secure. Perhaps even the Jets won the Stanley Cup. And then you think, this must be what it feels like to be living in, in God's will. At least that's what we think at the time from our limited perspective. And sometimes we feel like we have no idea what God is doing. What's happening makes no sense to us. We ask if God is really in control. We cry out in pain. We cry out in frustration. In the middle of a difficult situation, trying to find an answer to our question. You, you lose a job. School closes, a sick family member, the whole world gets put on pause because of a virus. And we think this must be what it feels like to not be in God's will. At least that's what we think from our limited perspective. Do we really know why God allows such things as a novel coronavirus? A quick Google search gives all kinds of ideas on the, on the topic. Some blame God for this new virus among humans and wonder if contracts can be cancelled due to the coronavirus by arguing that it is an act of God. According to jppost.com, 44% um, of Americans polled say they see the global coronavirus pandemic and economic meltdown as a wake-up call for us to turn back to God as signs of coming judgment. And Christianity.com says that contrary to what some are saying, the coronavirus is not the judgment of God for the sin of the world. But God can use the coronavirus for good because God is good. So apparently we may not know in the moment why things happen, but God sees the big picture and his wisdom, which often initially does not look like wisdom. All things will work for our good. Today is Palm Sunday, and we remember a day in the life of Jesus, the day when he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. At the time, some people thought that it was the best day ever. Surely this was the will of God. Others felt it was the worst day ever, and that Jesus needed, needed to be stopped. Our perspective is so limited. This morning, I want to take a look at the story as told in Matthew 21 and remember that Jesus knew what was going on. In all four Gospels, we read that as Jesus was entering the last week of his life before his death, it was clear that no one really understood why he had come to earth as a human. No one really knew his purpose and the Father's plan to accomplish it. In all four Gospels record the event, commonly referred to as the triumphal entry, although each author focuses on different details, but the story is the same. I'm going to quickly read the story to you from Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. And this is what the story says. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them. Bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you should say that the Lord needs them, and immediately he will send them. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, look, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, a foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, then they laid their robes on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their robes on the road, others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. And the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, he who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was shaking, saying, Who is this? And the crowds kept saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth 
in Galilee. After reading the story, it is clear that Jesus actually knows what is going on, and everyone else is in the dark. Earlier in Luke 9, verse 51, we read, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. It says Jesus intentionally, boldly, with determination, resolutely, he set out for Jerusalem. He knew what was waiting for him in Jerusalem, and yet he still went. Sometime before entering Jerusalem, Jesus told his disciples, as recorded in Matthew 20, 17-19, Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside, and he said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. The disciples did not know what was going on. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen in Jerusalem, and his disciples unwillingly accepted this right until the end, and they were despondent when he was arrested and crucified. They missed, or did not understand, the part of, about being raised to life on the third day. From their point of view, the worst thing possible had happened. The crowd did not either understand what was going on. John records that Jesus arrived in Bethany a few days before uh, the Palm Sunday, and that the day before, a dinner was given in his honor, among, and among those present, were Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Jesus was well known in Bethany. He had recently raised Lazarus to life after being dead for four days. And a large crowd of curious people came out to see him, as well as Lazarus, who had become a local celebrity. There was a lot of excitement in Bethany. There was a lot of hype. And John tells us that the crowd was spreading the words of what Jesus had done. And the next day, Jesus headed to Jerusalem riding a donkey. Jesus knew that riding into Jerusalem on a donkey fulfilled the messianic prophecy found in Zechariah 9.9. Where it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Zion. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. John records in chapter 12, verse 16, that at first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. See, Jesus knew. It was part of the Father's plan that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. That is the point of a prophecy that foretells the future. But the disciples and the crowd along with them did not realize the full messianic meaning of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on donkey. They were excited and did not miss the opportunity to honor Jesus and to declare him their Messiah or their King, something that many had wanted to do for a while. For the crowd, this was the best thing that could possibly happen. But they did not understand the prophecy. They did not realize that Jesus was fulfilling the prophecy at that point in time. But Jesus knew. They spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road, and they shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna is a, a word that comes from two Hebrew words. That means, Lord, save us. And here, what they were shouting, they were quoting from Psalm one eighteen twenty five, where it says, Lord, save us, or Hosanna. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. And Hosanna came to mean, uh, was came to be used as an expression of joy, expression of praise for deliverance granted or for deliverance anticipated. Here the crowd anticipated deliverance. that Jesus was going to do it, and so they were shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save us, um, anticipating that he would indeed save them, probably from the, from the Romans. Um, but that he would save them in one way or another. They declared Jesus to be the son of David, the expected Messiah. They, they recognized him as the Messiah. They shouted, Hosanna, Lord, save us. But they did not imagine how the salvation could take place, in what form it would take place. The crowd also did not realize that they were choosing Jesus to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They were at the beginning of the Passover week, the celebration in which the Jews celebrated God leading them out of slavery in Egypt in the time of Moses. In reading the story in Exodus, we are told in Exodus 12, 3-6, how the Israelites were to choose the lamb that they would slaughter, and with whose blood they would paint the doorframe of the houses so that the angel of death would pass over their home. This is what it says. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Verse 5. The animal you choose must be a year old male without defect. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. 
And four days before Passover, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and the crowd chose him to be their Messiah, their lamb, who would take away their sins. There was one other group of people who did not realize what was happening that day, the Pharisees. This group of religious law-abiding leaders who had lots of influence among the Jews, they had gotten tired of Jesus. The Pharisees enjoyed their positions of power and influence. They liked people who fit into the legalistic interpretations of the law, and Jesus did not fit. He healed people on the Sabbath. He didn't make his disciples wash their hands ceremonially. He was too popular for their liking. He was a little bit rebellious against all their laws, and he claimed to be the Son of God. He worried them. And when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, this was the last straw. In John 12, 19, it says that the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look at how the whole world has gone after him. They decided to make plans to kill him. And Jesus knew that they felt this way about him. He knew that they would kill him. And this is why he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. It was part of the Father's plan. But for the Pharisees, the crowd's excitement and praise for Jesus was not convenient. And they had to end it. Jesus knew that as he rode that donkey to Jerusalem, that he was riding to his arrest and his death by the end of the week. He knew that Judas would betray him. He knew that Peter would deny him. He knew that the rest of the disciples would abandon him. He knew that he would be hit, flogged, have a crown of thorns pressed into his head, have nails driven into his hands, and be crucified. Jesus knew all of this, and yet he did it because he saw the big picture. The time had come. In John 17, verse 1, it says this, after Jesus had said this, he looked towards heaven and he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world begin. It says here, Jesus knew that the hour had come. Jesus knew that his obedience would bring glory to the Father. Jesus knew that his obedience would give eternal life to all who believed in him. Jesus knew that his obedience would bring him back to the glory he had had with the Father before he came to earth. Jesus knew that the crowd shouting Hosanna needed him to go to Jerusalem. As he looked around at the crowd on that day, Luke tells us that Jesus wept. He said, if you even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But the crowd did not know. They did not know what would bring them peace, and so he wept. He loved those people so much. He knew how much they needed him in order to be able to have peace with God. But he also knew that many of them did not truly recognize who he was and did not really have faith in him, and so he wept. It was God's love for us that motivated him to send his son to earth to live a sinless life and to die a death that he did not deserve, so that all who put his faith in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And Jesus knew that many of the same people who were shouting Hosanna on that day would be shouting crucify him just days later, and that many of those people would never put their faith in him. And so he wept. Many of them would put their faith in him, and he knew that too. You may not always see the big picture, and you may not know what God is doing right now, but you can trust that God does know. You may not know or understand why the coronavirus is, is causing havoc in the world, why countries are shutting down, why so many people have lost their jobs, why so many can't go to work, why schools are closed, why loved ones are sick, why people are, are scared of getting sick. Um, we may not understand everything that's going on, and, but that's okay, because God does. And we can trust that God loves us and that all things work together for our good, as it says in Romans 8. You can trust that Jesus' death resulted in the forgiveness of all your sins. And because you trust God, because you know that God loves you, and because you love Him, you can shout along with all of those who saw Lazarus risen from the dead. And you can shout, Hosanna, Lord save us, Hosanna to the Son of David. Words that we need now as well, save us from coronavirus. More than that, save us from our sins. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's praise God. Let's praise Jesus together with those people on this Palm Sunday. Let's say and proclaim along with Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. 
Jesus has come. He is righteous. He brought salvation. He's a gentle God, a God who comes to save, a God who loves us, a God who knows exactly what is going on. May God bless you.